Well, folks, it is lovely to see you. Thank you very much, guys. You can rent these guys out. Weddings, bar mitzvahs, you name it. They do a very good, they do a good rate. That's a, that's a joke, or oh, you're a lively crowd, folks. You're a lively crowd today. Well, guys, I want to start with a, um, a funny story, if that's all right. I think it's funny. Maybe you won't. But my parents came up from the Midlands to stay with us last weekend. It's a, thank you. Well, thank you. I didn't think we'd get a round of applause. It's a big trip up the uh, A61, folks, leaving the dizzy heights of the West Midlands. So, and my, my dad, bless him, decided that he'd have a go on my eldest daughter's scooter. He's 77, still got it. Now, here's the thing, folks. In our new house, there's quite a long drive with quite a slope. So my daddy sets off, feeling pretty confident. And then he realized, folks, he didn't know how to stop. So he did a crash landing, a crash. And he managed to remove skin from his hands. He, he bru- <laughs> You're not laughing now, are you? <laughs> Bruised his face. Oh, dear, real nightmare. And bless him, he'd come to help us do some DIY. So he's, he's totally out of action. Anyway. That evening, um, we, uh, <laughs> he starts to say, oh, I don't know where my glasses are. Actually, what he says, I don't know where my glasses are. Uh, it's easy if I translate. I can't find my, I can't find my spectacles, if you've done this. So we're searching the house, and we're convinced. And it, and it turns out, on impact, as he fell off the scooter, his glasses flew off. Unfortunately, my wife, bless her, had taken the kids to a swimming lesson. And as she reversed down the drive, drove over his glasses. They were as flat as a pancake. But he's an engineer born and bred. And amazingly, if you ever remember Jack Duckworth off Caronation Street with them taped together, (laughs) you probably don't. All the young people are like, what? Anyway, there you go. So they're looking forward to another trip to Sheffield, folks. They really are. They can't wait. So gang, we are... Cruising through, the cruising through the book of Nehemiah. And Alan did an amazing job last week. If you were here, you'll notice that he skipped over all the difficult words. So next time, I'm going to redo the road, so make sure you have to get those words, mate, I tell you. Um, so we're looking through uh, Nehemiah. It's an amazing, amazing story of a prophetic call that God raises on, on one man's heart to rebuild Jerusalem, that, which is totally in tatters. It seems this absolutely impossible that, that, that anybody could even achieve this. And yet God has heard the call, um, that uh, Nehemiah has heard the call of God, that he stepped out in faith and he's starting this amazing process. And we're just going to dive in. We're going to look at chapter four um, for the first 14 verses. And this is what it says. When Sanballat, okay, let's start this. Sanballat sounds like an Ikea desk, don't you think? <laughs> It really does, Sanballat. So when Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, now just listen to these questions. What are those feeble Jews doing? What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up the guilt or blot out their sins from your sight. What a prayer. For they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall. He's writing as if it's a journal. So we rebuilt the wall till it reached half of its heights. For the people worked with all of their hearts. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard and knights to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is given out. And there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put an end to the work. 
Then the Jews who live near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. And fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. Amen. 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 If if you ever wonder about spiritual warfare, this this is it. This is a classic assignment. This is this is somebody who is stirred up by the enemy of God to really halt and stop and try to intimidate what it is that God is doing through Nehemiah. So here's Sanballat. Think of his name, the Ikea desk. Who is this guy? He's the governor of a place called Samaria. And we know through the gospel that that Samaria is a region that is pretty infamous. And he he has um, the name Sanballat. He's not actually a Swedish name, unfortunately, folks. He's actually a Babylonian name. And so he's kind of, people say that he's a career politician. He is somebody who has come from Babylon, or certainly his origins are from Babylon now. He's working under the Persians. And he's probably somebody who has, has cooked a deal with a number of different areas, a number of different leaders from different areas. And they've kind of formed a pact because none of them want Jerusalem to, they, none of them want Nehemiah to succeed. Because if Nehemiah succeeds, they know that if Nehemiah rebuilds the walls, then they know that as the kind of laws of the ancient world tell us, that as the walls are rebuilt, Jerusalem becomes a city again. And once it becomes a city, he's afforded certain rights. And so they do everything that they can do to try and frustrate and stop the building of the wall. Anything that they can do. Now, here's the thing that we know that Nehemiah has been sent by Artaxerxes, amazing name, has been sent by Artaxerxes. He said, so he, in other words, he has kind of like diplomatic immunity. So they can't physically stop him. They can't wage a war against Nehemiah. They can't come and capture him. They can't stop them. They're all that the only kind of weapon that they have is intimidation, lies, and pressure. And that is what we are beginning to see happen here. So they don't want Nehemiah to succeed in any way, shape, or form. It is totally in their interest. They are totally self-serving. They are totally interested in themselves to see him fail because they, therefore, remain in positions of power. And so that is why they're incredibly angry. And just listen to the type of manipulation that they use. Now, they've rocked up. Uh, to, to the builders, these are people that Nehemiah has fashioned. These are the people of God who Nehemiah has called upon and encouraged them to remember the call of God on his people. That, that if my people will turn from their wicked ways, humble themselves, I will heal their land. And so he's called together the people of God to say, do, do not be discouraged. There may be terrible things happening, but God has not forgotten us. Let, let's do this thing. And so Sanballat and his stooges turn up with all their pomposity and their power and their robes and their just impressiveness and their military might. And they stand and go to Jerusalem and say this, what are these feeble Jews doing? So so first there's kind of this deep anti-Semitism. What are these feeble Jews? It's, It's this racial slurs. What are these feeble Jews doing? They're not us. They're a different race. They're not part of us. They're different to us, which ties into the region, this deep despising of the Jewish people. So first of all, they start with serious discrimination. Then they said, will they restore their war? Will they offer sacrifices? Is this kind of a pee take of how important the temple is to the Jewish people? Will they finish it a day? And then comes the killer question. There's five questions that Sambala asks in front of these people. You can just imagine like the mockery, the kind of, the the just, the insidious questions that they know are designed to undermine. And then question five is this. Can they bring the stones back to life 
from those heaps of rubble burned as they are. Now, we know that part of the deal was fire had destroyed the walls. We know that the gates had been hanging off. We know that it had been a really torrid time for Jerusalem. So it's kind of weird, isn't it? Why would, why would he make a comment about bricks being burned? Now, people who are far smarter than me say this, that the type of stone they were used doesn't, doesn't stand up under pressure when it's, uh, after it's been burned. And so in the final of the, the, the kind of undermining, insidious questions, the last one is this. You don't even have the actual raw resources to build the wall. It's been destroyed. And if you're listening to that, you might think, oh, flip, they've got a point. And then Tobiah the Ammonite, he's like one of those bullies at school. Do you know what I mean? They're, He doesn't really do anything, but he just waits for his moment to say what he needs to say. To buy the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what are they building? Even a fox climbing on it would break down their wall of stones. To buy the Ammonite, what a classy guy. Even a fox? You've seen foxes, they're pretty light, aren't they? And they can jump like cats, but are they a dog? Who knows? But they're amazing at jumping. Have you seen them? They are remarkable, folks. They really are. Even the fox, as it jumps on the wall, will break it down. It is the very definition of this psychological warfare, these killer questions of mockery and ridicule, which leads to, some, which leads to this deep sense of tr- the intention is to bring about humiliation. We know that psychologists tell us we, we all have something called self-talk. The thing that we say over ourselves Their design, Sambalat, is trying to get into Nehemiah and the people of God's head to bring about an insecurity, self-doubt, fear, fear of failure. Have you ever been in those moments? Maybe at work? You've done a teaching practice? Somebody watches your lesson and they give you some feedback? What do you hear? Not what do they say, what is it you hear? You have a dream that God has placed on you, you think, I just cannot see how this is going to work. When Chris and I were in a previous church, we were missionaries down south. We were sent in a place called Cambridge. And you know, folks, it's pretty rough down there. There's a lot of crime. And... um, Part of, we're a lot, it's a long story. The context is this. We were there to help Anne McLaurin, absolute legend, who was here for many years. And she went down to Cambridge and she was there a year before us and we followed her and worked with her for nearly five years. And it was an, we learnt loads. It was an, an amazing time. And a bit like Charles Dickens, best of times, worst of times. Anyway, not anything to do with Anne, but I'm waffling. Anyway, one of the big features of our time there was a building project. I don't really know a huge amount about buildings, but I got, I got stuck in and was really involved in it. And I remember there was a particular moment where I was, a, a guy from the church had said, I, I really want to talk to you. So I, I went to see him at a pub in a little village just outside Cambridge. And we're having a conversation. And the conversation, um, I could feel that there was something on his mind. You know, like there's that awkward small talk and it gets more awkward. And then he went on to say that he, why he didn't think we were doing a very good job which is always encouraging when somebody tells you that. Why I didn't, wasn't doing a very good job. And then he was, and then he'd, he, he, he talked to other people. That's all, you know, so, he, so it wasn't just him, but he was representing the views of other people. And then he got onto the building project. Now, he worked in a particular profession that meant he did know what he was talking about. So when he kept saying, in my professional opinion, which he said a number of times, and then in his professional opinion, which he said he did day in, day out, and he listed all the places that he'd worked over long periods of time, and then like a lawyer, he wasn't a lawyer, but he could have well have been, he went through in, why, in his profession why it wasn't going to work in absolute detail after detail after detail. And you know, just the sense of faith, it just getting to shrink, I was getting smaller and smaller and smaller and small as he was going on, in my professional opinion, this isn't going to work. The heating's more and more and more and more and more. And then the killer question was this. You've lost the people and no one will give to it. 
And at that point, folks, we needed to raise £100,000. Uh, the other project wasn't going to go ahead. And we banked a lot on this it happening. And so it felt a bit like a humongous leap of faith out into fresh air, which is like, God, if you don't turn up, we're done. We just can't do it without you, God. And in that moment, as I listened to him, as I walked out from the meeting, I sat in the car and I felt this massive heaviness and intensity. And I thought, God, have we made a mistake? Have I made a mistake? We got this wrong. What if he's right? See, that's the thing, isn't it? When you meet with somebody who can seem quite cynical. The thing about Sam Ballots was he was right. His questions were right. How can you build with this stuff? That guy was right. His questions were right. Two weeks later, we had a gift day, which we need to raise a lot of money. And it was, now you might think, that's oh, Cambridge, it's rolling. They're up. But uh, quite a few people had left at this point, folks. Uh, and quite some people with some considerable means had left. So it was a bit of a stretch of faith. Even though you think it's down south, the money grows on trees, which it does, let's be brutally honest. <laughs> so we tr- with trepidation and nervousness, we're like, God... Maybe this is wrong. Maybe, maybe, we, maybe we, we did get all this wrong. Maybe we messed it up and, and 104,000 pounds was given in the day. 104,000 pounds was given in the day. Now, when I did that at nine o'clock, people were excited, but I can see that you are totally with me. You're a little more reason. You might, 104,000 pounds. I was like, God, you are with us. You did speak to us. You are going to do this. You are for us. In a day, everything that was needed was provided. Today, I want us to think about cynicism. I love a bit of cynicism. Do you know what I mean? I really do. When I was a kid, I thought, when I grow up, I want to be really cynical. Why not, eh? There's nothing else on the telly. We've got Netflix now, so you can choose what's on. Cynicism. You see, because cynicism, cynicism gets a bad press, doesn't it? It does. And it can be very tempting in like a, a kind of message like this from the Bible to say, oh, cynicism is really bad. But it isn't. Sometimes cynicism is very useful. Talk to a policeman or an ex-policeman. They're generally fairly cynical. <laughs> and there is an Alan Partridge quote, which I'm not going to say. But, he, you know, like people with optimism, with experience, cynics. There's a sense in which in some parts of our lives, we have to ask difficult questions. And if you are living in a world where people are lying to you, or you're living in a world where you're not, cynicism is an inevitable part of life. Only this week, we had a situation at school with our middle child where we have lost his reading book. Now, here's the thing, though. You would have thought the school, we had done something terrible that required the intervention of the police. But we lost the reading board. And when I spoke to the teacher, I said, look, we've lost the reading. She said, can you give us another? Sorry, no. I said, why not? She said, because it happens quite a lot. And I thought, this, we've had one child go through the school. This is the first time we have ever lost the reading board. Honestly, we've just moved house, and he gave it to his little sister. She's put it in a box, and we don't know where it is. Please, and I could sense the cynicism, which is you've just lost it and you can't be bothered to bring it in. So there is cynicism around us. Sometimes it's natural, it's part of life. I battle with it on a daily basis. What is cynicism? It's the mistrust of motives. It's disbelief in people's sincerity or their integrity. Believing people are fundamentally dishonest, and we all experience it if we're truly honest. As I told you that story about 104 grand, you will have felt that. Yeah, but it's down south. I rest my case, Your Honor. (laughs) We all experience it. But you see, the cynical people point out inconsistencies. Cynical people can be the people in in a meeting who say, yeah, really? Because we've tried that before and it didn't work. Sometimes there is a helpfulness. Like I love private eye. I love Ian Hislop. 
I love kind of political comedians. I love the fact that in comedy you can say things you can't normally say, but because it's comedy you get away with, that points out truth. There is a place for cynicism, folks. Why? Because number one, cynicism can be seasonal. Cynicism can, can, can insulate us from pain. It can be like a self-protective plaster. Like in our house, the kids, we get through plasters like there is no tomorrow. Like literally, my daughter will go, bad knee, it's nothing there. But sometimes if we just give her a plaster because it's just going to make this situation a lot easier. Like sometimes cynicism is the plaster we put on stuff when we've been pain, when we've been hurt, we've been let down, we've lost the job, stuff's not worked out. We've got sick. We prayed and God didn't move. It can be this sense of we can put it on us for a season to bring about self-protection. And sometimes that is normal. And sometimes, folks, I want to go out on a limb here. And if you send the email, alan.ward.stcsheffer.org.uk, I would say sometimes it's right because some of the stuff that happens in people's life is so terrible, you can see why you get there. It's a natural thing that happens in this broken world in which we live. Sometimes there are seasons where we go through doubt. Doubt is part of faith. I don't, I don't see that as, as mutually exclusive. Part of life. But here's the thing. Doubt, often coupled with a desire of curiosity, means that we grow. So if you're doubting and you're not sure about stuff, as I often do, if there is a curiosity, it leads to a place where we want to grow, find out more. For example, if you've had something really difficult happen in your life, which is, let's be just so honest, right? That's what happens in people's lives. Now, those terrible things can drive us away from God or they can drive us closer to God. Sometimes the difference is curiosity. So a hard thing that can happen in life can mean that that curiosity drives us to get around other people. Alan talked about brilliantly about community last week. can mean we get around people who've experienced it, have lived through it, and have come out the other side to tell a tale. You think, well, have you done it? Have you lost a child and you're still in church and you still love God? How can you even do that? Let me tell you my story. There can be a curiosity that drives us through pain and through seasons of doubt where we want to grow and we want to learn from those times to grow as disciples so we can follow what it is that Jesus is saying. There is another type of cynicism, folks, which is like a terminal cynicism, like a self-protective layer which points out continually faults which hides behind a sarcasm or humor. You know, I use that as a device. You might have seen that. And honestly, if we've got terminal cynicism, if it's kind of kicked in, it can affect other people. If you're in a small group with somebody who is permanently cynical, it just kills the atmosphere. You know? Hey, guys, what do you think about this? Well, I've been around a long time. It didn't work the last time. (whistles) Bang. Anybody like to pray? just kills it. You see, when we have, when our heart has become hardened, sometimes through no fault of our own from pain and loss, which is not processed, and cynicism sets in, we can affect the people around us, whether it be your marriage, your friendships, you can disengage from community, And because it's primarily rooted in self. I'm right. You're wrong. My experiences tell me this will not work. You will not do it. And the heart gets harder the more we pursue the self. It becomes pride. And so the cynical person could be right. Point out what's wrong. But they can be so wrong because it's rooted in a place of self and it has its home in a place of pride. So how does Nehemiah teach us anything about cynicism? Sambalat's motives are clear. He's protecting himself. He's protecting his own interests. He uses cynicism as a device to try and undermine God's people. A couple of things. Nehemiah prays like crazy. In fact, his prayer from verses 4 through to 5 is pretty intense. And then you've got Sambalat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashtar heard that they're not able to stop the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls. Their cynicism is not able to penetrate their hearts because there's a desire for faith. 
And then there's a, 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 this amazing thing where, the, where they're getting so frustrated that, that they begin to say, well, we're going to kill them. Now, they can't, they can't overrun them. So what they do is, is the Jews that are living within a 30-mile radius out in the sticks begin to hear of their plans. And so they go and say to Nehemiah, look, they're going to try and infiltrate you. They're going to try and kill you. They're going to try and physically stop you. And Nehemiah says this, before they knew it or see us, we, uh, this is what they said to Nehemiah, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to their work. I mean, if their if they're, if they're insidious cynicism didn't block it, the physical threat of violence would stoke fear. And then it says this, the Jews who live near them came and told us ten times. Can you imagine being told ten times that they're coming to kill you? I mean, I would just be like, let's get the heck out of here. This is done. Forget it. It's not worth it. Then it says this, verse 13. Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. What does he do? He makes the most genius tactical move, and he turns Jerusalem into a fortress. So he says to the families that have become the builders, with their, like, their, their trowel in one hand and their sword in the other, he's like, stand in the most vulnerable places. Stand there. Keep watch, keep praying. And then he says this, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And listen to this. And he says, and fight for your families. What is the thing that we love the most? It's our families, the things that are personal, your sons and your daughters. It's like dig deep. Lean in the thing that you're most passionate about. It's probably your family. So fight for them. Remember that God is good. Revelation 12, 11, They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. It's a, a metaphor from Revelation. When John writes that, that it's, a, it's a legal metaphor, that, that, that Satan is the prosecutor and that God's people are, are, are in the dock. And the defense lawyer comes and he says, that remember your story. Remember the story of God moving in your life. Remember how he's rescued you. And he said, remember Jesus who died for you, who's freed you, who's forgiven you. You're free. He has no hold over you. Nehemiah says, remember him. Remember the one that redeemed you from Egypt. Remember the promise of God. If my people will humble themselves and call on my name, I will heal their land. Remember him, the one who loves you. Remember testimony and truth. Remember those whom you love. Remember those in your communities. Again, Alan spoke about this brilliantly last week. If you didn't hear, I recommend that you listen to it. You see, in this season at this time, as we're coming out of COVID, let's look around the room, folks. There's a lot of people not here. I spoke to a guy who's a vicar on the south coast, and he said they've lost 50% of their church in the pandemic. As we stand in the gap, as we stand praying, we need to pray and call out to God and get in touch with and hear the prophetic cry to pray for people to return to Jesus. Maybe they're called to another church. Maybe they've given up on community. Maybe cynicism through the season has set in deep. It's become terminal. It's moved from a preoccupation with COVID because it's like multiple Netflix box sets, isn't it? We're all, it's just like, is it going away? And they just think, well, I'm fed up with God. I've give, I, I enjoy hanging out on Sundays, in the, going out to the Peak Districts. When the weather's been better, I might come back now, the weather's not so good. And it's good for the kids. It's like, where is God at work? Where are people? And what is our heart response to them in this season? Maybe cynicism has set in for you. And so when you've heard of the past couple of weeks and we talk about the city, you go... Yeah, heard it before. I mean, how are we going to do that? Less people. How are we going to do it? Today, folks, we're going to launch something on this Thanksgiving Sunday called the Nehemiah Fund. <laughs> Is somebody in pain? <laughs> get, a, get a doctor. I would love to tell you that we, that we should have, if but there's a long story, we basically bungled the comms, folks. I'm just not going to lie to you why, why we haven't got asking you for money today. We bungled the comms. Just be honest. It's my fault. But this is what we're going to do. Because we feel that in this next season, 
post-pandemic world, that we are called to partner with the Church of England and the Yorkshire Baptist. I'm not sure how it's going to work out yet, but we're committed to that. We've signed the paper and working with them to plant embassies of hope, church plants, where we're living under the rule and reign of God in a nation where MPs have been murdered in their surgeries, godly people who love Jesus, by people filled with hate. And we'll go out different parts of the city, play our part. Thank you. And we'll go to different places as directed by the bishop and the Baptists. They don't have a bishop, they're Baptist equivalents. <laughs> Sorry, Alan. We'll, <laughs> that we'll go where they tell us to plant embassies of hope. And I don't know whether you, when you hear that and you think, I'm in, or you think it'll never work. Because as the rubber ball, the first returnee back to Jerusalem says, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. If the Lord has called it and called us, and if we draw close to him and remember the victories of God, remember the story of our own salvation, remember the stories that God has done amazingly through this church through many years. If he is for us, then who can stand against? The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And so we're going to launch a fund. You'll get more information in the next couple of weeks. And at the start of Advent, which celebrates, yes, Jesus coming as a baby, but also his future return, we'll give that day. And there'll be different ways it will develop and grow, but it's specifically go, going to how we can release church plants in different parts of the city of Sheffield. Thank you. We're going to give away. We're going to seek the Lord because the last time I checked the bank balance, <laughs> we can't do it. But He can. He can. And I wonder if the Lord is calling us to a level of faith and trust in Him that comes from a place of deep intimacy and connection through the Spirit back to the Father heart of God. That we love Jesus, we embrace his call, and once again remember that he has called us. And the thing that we may need to check is the cynicism levels in our hearts. Check what is it that we're listening to. Is it the kind of cynicism, cynicism of Sam Ballot and his cronies? Or is it the call of the Spirit? And maybe, folks, you've been hurt. And maybe there are leaders who've hurt you. And I say sorry if that is your case. And maybe the Spirit wants to bring the, the healing balm of his presence to bring restoration and healing. So once again, you can trust him as he leads you on the journey to where he wants to take you for the sake of this city and for the sake of the kingdom of God.